pack with llamas. Llamas are, I think, an incredible pack animal. Uh, extremely agile, sure-footed, quiet. Uh, they make less of an impact than humans do in the environment. Um, they're extremely efficient, uh, self-reliant, intelligent. Um, they can carry more weight per their own body weight than any other pack animal does. What I particularly like about them as a backpacker is, is they're quiet and they are uh, they don't smell. They're unobtrusive. As a backpacker I went in the mountains to get away from the crowds and the urban hustle and bustle and uh, the llama was a perfect companion. Just perfect. Could go virtually anywhere that I wanted to go. Carry my pack for me. Uh, not be pushing me around. I didn't have to be concerned about um, what was happening with the llama. The llama took care of himself. And uh, I was free to enjoy the environment. I could be quiet, I could run, I could walk, I could climb uh, through just about any kind of terrain. The llama would just follow me uh, like a pet uh, on a loose lead. And uh, I really liked that. They're very curious, uh, very inquisitive, very alert. They know exactly what's going on out there. They know where other animals are. They know far sooner than dogs or horses or other animals seem to be aware of things like bears and deer that you encounter occasionally out there. Moments spent with the llamas on a one-to-one, -one, away from the her from the herd. Now maybe with they're with the rest of their pack string, but at, with that at that moment when you are hiking with that one llama, your relationship changes. It's not. It's you're both in new territory. You're experiencing something new together. It's one of the most special times. Llamas are becoming more popular as pack animals for both work and pleasure. The methods used in packing with llamas are quite diverse. There is not one right way but a multitude of approaches. This videotape will present the views of five commercial llama packers. Francie Greth Pato has packed with her husband, Guy Pato, since 1977, and they say that they were the first to offer this service commercially in the United States. Mama's Llamas packs in Northern California, Alaska, and Peru. Stephen Biggs of Shasta Llamas is also a veteran, having started packing in 1978. He arranges trips into the Marble Mountains and Trinity Alps of Northern California. Barbara Goldsmith of Rocky Mountain Llamas near Boulder, Colorado, has specialized in training llamas since 1978. In this tape, she will demonstrate her method of initial training to accustom an inexperienced llama to carry a pack. Tom Landis of Oregon Llamas has packed into Oregon's wilderness areas since 1982. He has conducted many treks for the Sierra Club. Stan Lynn Doherty of Hurricane Creek Llamas does most of her packing in her backyard, the marvelous Wallala Mountains in northeastern Oregon. She has been offering trips since 1984. So among these five packers, a combined experience of about four decades is represented. In choosing a llama for packing, what conformation do you look for? Well, as you can see, I've got animals that have decidedly different conformation here. Stanford is stocky, very woolly, and um, fairly long back. Quincy, this one here, he's a little small, but I think he's probably got a fair bit of Wanako blood in him and uh, from somewhere back down the line. And he's tough, even though he's small, never complains, carries whatever load I put upon him. And uh, he's a little high-strung, but um, all his other attributes make him worth it. T-shirt, the one behind him, um, good size, strong body, good temperament. I don't have any qualms about loading him with 100 pounds. And so he's probably real close to what my view of good pack llama confirmation is. One of my animals that's very weak is tall and thin and long-legged and has the conformation that you that a lot of people think is, is best for a pack llama, but 
he's just weak. He can't carry as much as the others. I think it has a lot to do with just heart and attitude, and that's really hard to tell when you're looking at a llama that you want to buy. I look for good sound confirmation, good muscle on the inside front leg, um, uh, not necessarily a, a big, wide, deep chest, but a good chest on an animal that shows muscle. Um, I look for a moderately wooled animal. Muscles and, and good straight legs are important. First of all, I think a llama that is tall and lanky is best rather than one that's short and heavy boned. Um, the tall one that is long legs, not heavy, seems to be able to go much further, uh, carry a, um, at least the same or heavier load without exhausting himself. Um, I've seen that over and over again. They just make the best packers. Do you look for a particular personality in llamas you choose to pack with? Trapper. Um, who you can see over here, he is so sweet that he's worth his weight in gold. You know, I, I can't put a hundred pounds on him, but uh, he's so good with people. I want him to lead up. If I take him out for a little walk, I want him to follow right along. I don't want to have to pull him through things. Um, I want him to show a certain amount of willingness from the start. Some of that you can train into a llama, but um, yeah. It's kind of a subjective thing, the personality. You have, to, you have to kind of feel that out. When I got them here, they were difficult to halter, um, didn't want to have their feet picked up, didn't want to be messed with in general. But both of them, the minute I put the pack saddle on them, loaded them up, led them down the road, I never had another squawk out of them. Mm -hmm. Coyote was a little bit slower on the trail to adapt to uh, obstacles and if you strung him up third in a group of three, two would go down the trail and Coyote would see an elk trail and just decide mm -hmm. that that was the way he had to go. So it took him a little longer to tune in to some of the trail um, behavior, but he did not object to the pack, never bucked, never, uh, once that pack was on him, he was all business. Cupcake was the same way, only his personality sweetened up a little bit more um, in, in, in other words, he would come up and kind of sniff you and want a little bit more interaction and doesn't mind taking pellets from your hand. Coyote, he's always just all business. Leave me alone and I'll carry the pack. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I've packed some. I've packed a guitar on him that banged and twanged as it went down the trail. Nothing seems to bother him once he's loaded up. But he's not a, he's not a people-oriented llama. He's not a congenial llama as a, as a personality. But he's the most consistent um, critter I've got as far as just doing his job and doing it well. Well, there, there are those that seem to be more cooperative than others. Um, they, they seem to be more willing. And uh, some will just balk and, and uh, lag behind and not really want to do it. You've got to work harder with them to, to get them to go along. But there are others who really take to it very nicely and very readily. And um, I don't really know what the difference is, but uh, they're just more willing. And um, I think one way of telling is, is just how easily they are to, to lead. Um, if you take them out, lead them on a rope, and see how willing they are to follow you, you can usually tell how they're going to be packing, you know, the, putting a pack on the back isn't going to make that much difference. How old should a llama be to begin packing? He's only three, so he gets a lot of flack from the other animals. This is Andy. Andy's only three, too. He's, these two, Stanford and Andy, are the, the two trainees. And they have your normal uh, first-time llama problems going the wrong way around the tree so the llama in front of them goes one way, they go the other. You have to stop and untangle them. A little balky, they don't know how much weight they can carry. Pooping in the creek, right? We usually start them out at about two years of age. Uh, we may take them along in a year and a half to get them used to the terrain and so forth, but we're not really loading them until they're 
two years of age, and we're not fully loading them until they're three. Yesterday I put the panniers on him with about 15 pounds a side and took him out for a walk. Before that he'd been on one walk with the panniers on with nothing in them, just out on the trail for a day hike of about six miles. He's a little over two years old. He was raised at Tom's farm, then sold, and then I, I got him about three weeks ago. He's a good-sized llama for his age. He's a very athletic animal. At what age should a llama retire from packing? We're starting to retire llamas, having some of them um, retire here. We have one that's retired here, um, and then we have a couple of other llamas who we, we could sense, experiencing what we did with the first llama, that they were getting to the point where commercial packing was too much for them. It would be like um, the professional athlete retiring from the, the active professional mm -hmm. life, but still being able to play the sport. We wanted to, for our llamas to have that kind of lifestyle rather than commercial packing them to the point where they could pack no more and then they were simply retired to the pasture, put out to pasture as it were. So we have um, two other llamas who last summer went into what we called semi-retirement where they moved off with a young family who only wanted to use them as pets for the most part, but family packing from time to time, a few times in the summer, and that would be all. With Gringo, that's not been the case. He's older than the two that we just um, put into semi-retirement, and he is showing no signs of slowing down. He's as active as he ever has been, I think. And you said he's about 16? He's about 16. This is Andy, who's quite old. He's the one I was telling Rosanna about, who's 27. And um, he's does, he does not want to be handled anymore. He'll tolerate being put on a lead rope, but um, he just doesn't, it, emotion, it upsets him. He was a packer for a long time, and he did beautifully, but he's just testy now that you he's so old. You were able to pack him until he was how old? Um, we packed him until, we, we believe him to be 27, so we packed him to be when he was about 22, 23. And that was with slightly small loads? Mm-hmm, uh -huh. mm -hmm. he carried less and less. Is there any advantage to having a smart llama on the pack stream? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, he's smart, coordinated. He knows exactly how wide he is. Um, he remembers routes from previous years. I'll come to a, a place where the trail can go one or two ways, and he'll just automatically take the right way. A couple weeks ago, we were in the steams, and we came to this one place where he knew that up the trail a little ways there was a spot where he had a, he'd have a hard time getting through because his packs were so wide and I didn't remember that and he took the one route and I took the other route and he just he refused to go on the route that I wanted him to take <laughs> so we went the other route they both led the same place and when we got there to that spot I realized that his route was the right way he's a llama genius so when somebody goes to purchase llamas for packing, ideally they should be able to take the animal out for a walk of an hour or so. I think if you're purchasing one that is uh, trained, in other words, a trained uh -huh. pack llama, one that's either trained to carry a pack but maybe has never been on the trail, or uh -huh. else has trail experience, that you should never purchase a llama like that without taking him for a walk. Because that, that's when you find out. if. Oh, they, they're kind of slow, or oh, they leap across streams, or oh, they, you know, they get to a log and they don't know what to do. Um, or, yeah, they'll go a half a mile and then they'll sit down. And some of that is from just general personality, some of that is from training. Does degree of wooliness make a difference in packing? Well, certainly for packing, less wool is desirable. However, a, um, a fairly woolly llama can be sheared. So that's not really a problem. Um, you can shear that wool, but they can b become overheated and stressed. Uh, if you're packing where it's hot and they're carrying a heavy load, they're doing a lot of climbing, they've got a heavy wool coat on, they can, they can become stressed and overheated. He's a little too woolly. I'm debating about whether I should shear him or not, or at least cut his wool down somewhat. It's my opinion that the llamas that have a higher percentage of guard hairs have coats that will stay cleaner longer and will look better. Strider, the black one here, has lots of guard hair. 
his coat always looks good. Does it make a difference if packers are intact or gelded? I don't notice them packing any differently. The geldings can be just as um, obstreperous as the studs in terms of herd relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the studs are a little more active in the field, pacing the fence, running around a little bit. That helps to condition them some. I used to pack with all my animals intact, and I never had any problems. But I've gelded a lot of them recently because when you have them on a farm with females also, they're, um, they just fight too much. Mm -hmm. John, for instance, here, he was fighting so much we had to move him to another farm. How many llamas does it take to go packing? Well, it certainly depends upon how much you're going to take. <laughs> if you're going to carry backpacking food and travel real light, then one llama can support two people for a very long time. Um, maybe a month. But um, if you go like we go with our trips, we're taking nine llamas for 12 people. Because we carry all fresh food and everything's heavy and we carry quite a bit of it. So, um, including wine in bottles. So that's, that's heavy. So we have to carry the, take the extra llamas to carry the extra weight. Do you have any words of advice about catching a llama in the field? You herd them into the corrals and then have them in a smaller enclosure. And this one actually works well for me. As a single person, I can herd them in and then gradually get them into the smaller and smaller, the ones that aren't used to being caught yet. I actually bring them into this small, close the gate and then they're, they're caught, basically. So you don't do a lot of mad chasing around trying to get them in the corner sort of thing. <laughs> oh, well. I can't catch any of my animals. I mean, I can trick them into coming in here, but I don't have an animal that I can... Run down. ...that I can come out in the field and catch. I just have never trained them to do that. What aspects of training are important? I strongly believe in, in a training method that allows you to work with the llama's sensibilities and personality and, and, and working with rather than dominate. Um, I think if you're, if you're working with your llama, that llama is almost intuitively going to want to pack for you. Um, it may not want to carry this the, this strange thing on its back initially, it may feel uncomfortable just because it's new. But I think if you've desensitized your llama, i.e. if it knows how to wear a halter, it knows how to have its head touched, you need to be able to touch its legs so that if it gets entangled in something you can help it out without having it panic. You need to be able to touch its back and its belly because you're going to have your hands on its back when you're cleaning it to put the pack on. You're going to have your hands under its belly, if not doing a cinch, because some packs cinch under the belly. If it doesn't cinch under the belly, you still have to reach over and get the other side of the cinch. So you're fiddling around underneath this animal's body and it needs to be okay with that. But the most important thing, I just want to bottom, bottom line, is if you're tense, let it go, walk away, come back another time. Now this llama, has not had his legs desensitized and I've started to work with him a little bit it's always good to make sure that the llama's toes are trimmed I'll try it and see if I can pick up a front leg with him he's we only had one little session with it and they're naturally quite shy of that so it takes a little work to get them over it easy we'll scout we'll scout you're all right Stand. Foot, please. Foot. Foot. Good. And then I reach down and pat it a few times so they kind of get used to me holding it. Thank you. See, he's struggling that right now. I'm not going to let it go until he stops. Good boy. Now Barbara Goldsmith 
will demonstrate her method of introducing packing equipment to a llama who has never packed before. I think because he's a little spooky about being touched down here still, I'm going to take the steak line and desensitize him a little bit. There he's, he's better. I'm going to drop this over his back. I'm going to use this simply to touch him a little. Okay. That's a boy. That's good boy. Just let him feel this. Good boy. That's good, Butch. Good, Butch. That's good. That's exactly what he's going to feel anyway when he has the cinch. Yes. This is just a way of extending the arms and letting him feel firmly a touch like that. And then my kind of touch is very firm on the llama, and I sometimes find patting is the nicest way to make them feel a little more secure. I pat and rub and stroke and that's a good boy. This llama has not yet learned to stake and he's quite sensitive about the legs when he feels something there and that's something he'll learn in the course of having his pack on. It doesn't matter much whether you teach the llama to stake before he learns to wear his pack or after, but he should be taught to stake before he ever goes out on a pack trip. He should be taught to stake at home in a very safe place with no obstacles. He's about clean enough to think about putting on his training pack. Favorite first tool for getting a llama desensitized to accept a pack is just a plain old duffel bag this one has a handle on the side, which makes it quite convenient. If you don't have anything like that and you happen to have access to paperboy bags, they make an, an awfully good thing too. I have used this, and I still use this for some other purposes. But something that's fairly soft and floppy like this is what I prefer to start with. Can I tell you something? Uh, good boy. What do you think of that? Notice he shows a little bit of nervousness in the in the mouth motions he made just then. Fast mouthy good boy. That's good. There. Look at that. Good boy. And I proceed just to rub the llama with this a little bit. Rub him on the neck and the least sensitive area on the neck and the shoulder is less sensitive. I put it on like that. I pat it and make noises with it. That's a good boy. And I just take it off again. If he wants to look at it again. Anytime a llama is curious about some thing that we're doing or a place I'm going to leave him, I like him to have plenty of time to look at it. Good boy. That's a good boy. I rub it on his neck again. That doesn't seem to bother him very much. Good lamb. The noises are important because once in a while you have straps or Velcro or things like that on packs and they need to get used to all the noises that come with packing. Good boy. He's really not reacting a whole lot to this. If a llama were to plunge about some I would go a little more slowly and I might untie him so that I can hold him and he can move away from it, but Butch really isn't exhibiting that much fear of it, so I'm just continuing to pat and good boy. What a nice fella. That's it. Good man get a little more casual about putting it on and taking it off. That's good. I think the canvas has just enough weight to it that it's something he feels when it's on his body. If it were very, very light, it would be like nylon. It might be a little slipperier. <laughs> if he moves quickly, doesn't hurt anything, he's going to get used to it anyway. Good boy. On purpose, 
once in a while if a llama jumps it may fall off but I actually like it to and I want him to get used to that because you want your pack llama to be pretty unflappable if something does fall off I'm just going to lead him around with that on his back. I've devised what I call a little training saddle. Um, I have made them out of leather. Since that's pretty expensive, I've now made some out of Cordura with a foam lining, and it seems to be just as satisfactory and not nearly as expensive. Um, this is not necessary really to teach a llama to pack. Depending on what pack you're going to use, you can use the saddle off the pack. Uh, this is a Shasta uh, pack with its saddle and you could just as well use this. So the first thing I do here is fasten the cinches up with the Velcro. And I'm going to introduce him to this just the same way I did to the canvas. It's really, by now, because of using the, the other bag on him, he's not really afraid of this at all. So I'll take the front cinch first, and I'm going to attach a regular lead rope to it like that. And I'm simply going to walk in front of him, laying the rope on the ground, and ask him to step over it. That's good for Good for Now before I pull this up, I want to have a good hold on the saddle, like that. Good boy. Since I already had the stake line around his middle, he's really not too sensitive to that. That's a good boy. And notice that he's not afraid of the Velcro sound. A little bit nervous about it, but not very much. Be very careful when you're cinching llamas not to get any wool pulled, because that really is uncomfortable. So this does not need to be very snug at this time. It's just snug enough to make it stay on and make him know that it's there. What a good boy. His reactions really are minimal to this. And one of the things I like to do now with this and with these D-rings is to let him feel things around his chest. But before I do that, I'm going to lead him with this cinch on the front. This bothers him quite a bit to have anything around his chest, and I particularly want him to get used to that because later he may have to wear a breast collar on his pack or a crupper. And with these D-rings, I can simply pull that through there, and I can undo it just that quickly if I want to. So the D-rings are quite handy for that. That's one reason I made this little pack. And notice this can be done with one hand completely so that you can hold the llama. Now, if that feels odd to him, and it does a little bit, uh, he's stepping very high. <laughs> good boy. That's a good boy. I find that any time a llama acts a little goosey about a new piece of equipment on his body, and he thinks, my, I can't operate with that, if you just lead him a short distance, he soon seems to think, oh, well, I can operate just as normal with that thing on me. And it only takes a time or two to do that. I can pull on this a little so that he really feels that and I can put it down further. And that's where it bothers him the most is down near his foreleg. I'm going to do the same thing with the back cinch as I did with the front cinch. I'll snap a lead rope onto here. Again, I just want him to step over that so that I can pull it up. I don't need to reach under his tummy. And 
the advantage is not just that you don't have to reach under there if the llama should be uh, startled and kicked, but it allows you to hold the saddle with the other hand if you need to. Sometimes I do this with a llama tied up, it really doesn't matter, but um, if he does move, you don't have to let go of the cinch, and that's, that's the best advantage of it. Come, Butch. Come. Good boy. Good boy. That's it. Now, see, he's partly because I desensitized him there with the fake line. He's really not that ticklish about the plank anymore. So we'll just fasten that up. There. That's a good lad. Yeah. Good boy. Okay. And again, I don't make it very snug. It's just, um, turn around. It's, it's not snug. It's just, uh, it's not just snug enough to really stay on well. And again, I leave him with that so that he feels perhaps, uh, certainly the, the back cinch is a more ticklish one for a llama than the front one, just as it is for a horse. Okay. You're doing very good. You're doing very good. This generally makes some kind of reaction, but still, he's not being too bad about that. Sometimes I just let it trail behind. So many packs have bridging on them, they need to get used to the feel of things back there just as well as around the chest. Good boy, you're being very good. And just as with the front one, I can pull it up to here. All this with one hand and just let me feel that. I can also pull on it if I need to. Good boy. Now I'm going to lead him back and forth a few times with that. That is ticklish. Come with Good boy. If he kicks, he just simply has to get used to it. Sometimes, if I want to teach a llama to actually carry something, you can carry firewood in a thing like this. You run the next, this next strap right through these rings and they can load firewood in there or a couple of gallons of water or one gallon on each side so it's even. But basically, he's accepting that quite nicely. Good, good. Let's see what he'd do with a regular pack. Again, if he shows any apprehension at all, I, I rub him with it in the least sensitive place, in this case, on the neck and the shoulder. That's no big deal. Now, I haven't put a pad under this, and many people don't because it's got so much sheepskin. Sometimes I still use a, a regular saddle pad with it, but I can let that drop down. And good boy. Very good. See, basically, he's standing for having his cinch put on very nicely. If he is a little loosey about it, 
the best thing is to hold it quite as, as firm as you can. But this shows the advantage of using the, uh, the lead rope. This is exactly what might happen if you're just using your pack to keep him with. I'm going to snug the front one up just a little more. Once they are used to the feeling of a cinch firm on them, they don't seem to mind when you begin to make it a little snugger, just so long as you don't pull wool while you're doing it. So, he's wearing a proper cast a saddle here. Let's see what he thinks of these bags. How about these bags, which? How about these bags? Any interest in this at all? Good boy. Stand. Stand. Oh, you're good. Yes, you are. You're very good. You're very good. You'll be a fine packer. Yes, you are. Here. He wasn't expecting me to put it clear over on that side. But still, his reaction was not very great. Good boy. That's okay. Actually, I think what I'll do is tie him up right here. But you've got to get used to this kind of noise when you go to put things in the bag, and that's a little scary. He's not quite used to having things flopped on him too much yet. But I don't want to stress him too much today. This side has his rain fly in it. Here. All right. Good boy. Good boy. Now, this kind of pack does have a breast strap, and it also comes with a crupper when one needs to use it. But on this first day, this is he's accepted all this so nicely today that and he's still touchy on the chest, so I, I don't want to actually put this on him today. I would continue instead to work with him with the rope around the front. And he's accepting my patting him on the chest right now, but he's still quite nervous, so that'll take a few days yet to get him used to that. Now with a llama like this, what I would do tomorrow is put this pack on and put uh, get two gallon bottles and fill them with water, plastic bottles, and I put one on each side. A gallon, a full gallon bottle weighs nine pounds, so he'd be carrying 18 pounds, and I'd put one on each side, and I don't have to bother to weigh it. And I'd go for a walk, uh, take him out on a trail where he's been, or someplace, even, even someplace new, because he's quite ready to do that kind of thing. And he's really accepted all this very, very well indeed. What kind of pack equipment works best for you? Packs are like, for llamas, are like backpacks for people. And um, they're almost like, but they're also almost like a religion. <laughs> people become really aligned to something that they believe in, and their belief system uh, is so strong that I'm, I don't want to say that it colors the picture, but it's just, it's total. And I, f I have three kinds of packs. I have, two, uh, I have two frame packs and um, the soft pack. We commercially use the soft pack only, the three-piece soft pack. It works the best for us on our commercial trips consistently. Was it you who designed the Mama's Llama pack? Guy and I did, yeah. Guy actually was the primary designer of, of that pack. He worked with it more than I did. Um, he had the idea of how the weight should be balanced and um, he worked with, you know, with the concept of, of the three-piece pack and the way that one's designed. What I mean about them, about those packs being com 
compared to people packs is that there are internal frame packs, the people mm -hmm. that are soft packs, that people really like to wear on their back. I have one that I really enjoy wearing. I like it better than my Kelty frame pack. Um, the, my experience with the frame pack on the llama is that um, their back seems to have a shape that, that, does, that has no withers for, for the frame to settle nicely on. And it seemed to me that there was always something that the frame was, was uh, some bony structure of their body, some, some solid portions, if, as it were, that was being receiving, that was receiving pressure from the uh, hard pack frame. There have been a lot of different frame packs out, so I think people are working with this uh, dynamic, you know, with how best a frame pack sits on a llama. Um, for me, I have just found the flexibility of the soft pack um, with the movement of the llama to be the most comfortable for them. And the way I judge that is by, you know, what the llama tells me by its body language and by its affect when it's having the pack put on and when it's hiking with it. Um, you know, what can I say? I really like it. A llama who has a really sharp spine like this uh, really needs to wear a pack that would not uh, sit with anything harsh on the spine. There are some kinds of frame packs, for example, that might be too wide for a llama with a sharp back, in which case the, the metal of it could sit right on the spine and that would be very painful and no amount of padding will will remedy that. These are an adaptation of the Colorado Pivot Pack. This is a Colorado Pivot Pack. This one's made out of heavy metal, this one's made out of aluminum. Feel the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Llamas are quite lightweight on the equipment. I've had this one now for three years and it's functioning just fine. This past spring I adapted the Latigos to be more like the Shasta pack with the Velcro while the, they originally came with these type of Latigos which are very common for pack animals hmm. with this knot. Yeah. Right. If you're doing eight llamas at a time this takes a lot of time to do these knots on each animal. I figured the extra weight that I've saved by going with aluminum allows um, you know you to carry just a little bit more load. These are pony pads that I ordered just from the green drawers. The one of the advantages of this saddle is that you can use not only panniers with the strap attachments, but you could lash on a load in a similar fashion as horse packers do, manty things up in a bundle or use panniers and and then um, carry a kayak, carry a whatever cooler on either side, you know, by lashing it on. I personally prefer the frame pack saddles because I come from a horse packing background and I believe that the frame supports the load while the soft pack saddles pad the animal's back and the load rides on the animal's back with less support. The area, this, this frame pack saddle, the area of the load is, is more dispersed around this the other one, it's just kind of on the back here and here. Um, Tom uses the other kind and has for years, and his animals' backs don't seem to be any you mean more shanty? stressed out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put this soft pack on Bo. It's a Shasta pack. And there are many other soft packs that are similar to it in that you have a, a relatively flexible saddle that goes on the llama. Some of them are cloth, others of them are leather. Um, this has a lot of features that I like, but there are a lot of others that would work for many of your recreational packers. This has a dual set of pads on the underside that will hold it up off of his backbone and Velcro cinches or Velcro to hold the cinches on in any case. Well, when I designed them, I, I wanted something that would be really easy to use. In other words, they're easy to load, they're easy to put on llamas, they're easy to take off llamas. I want them to be lightweight, I want them to be really strong and durable. I didn't want to have to be worried about um, excess weight of a heavy frame. I didn't want to have extra blankets and other materials I had to be concerned about when I'm out there. Um, 
I just like to be out there and not have to be futzing around with all kinds of equipment and trying to get the llama loaded and unloaded and things like that. This is a copy of the Colorado Pivot Pack that Jim Hook developed. And I had it manufactured for me out of aluminum, which is a lot lighter than the, than the steel they used to come in. As you can see, it's hinged so that it will clamp down on the animal. And some people think that's cruel to clamp it down on him like a vice. And I worried about that at first when I first used them, but I've used this pack for five or six years and I like it a lot. It's a lot cheaper than the other packs. And it's very functional. That saddle is on there solid. I've never used butt strap or breast collar with this. And they really stay where they're supposed to stay. I have panniers that I hook over these trees and they hang on either side. This is a lot more similar to your uh, horse packing style. It's the ones they use don't hinge. The lady who owns this llama has made her own pack from a kit. This comes from Wildwood Llamas in, in uh, Allen's Park, Colorado. And it's got a, a lightweight saddle. This could be used for training a llama perfectly well. This is the front cinch, and it goes straight down. And the back cinch is set on an angle on purpose so that it will match the curve of the llama's stomach. This has stiffeners here that run on either side of the spine. To um, Obviously, those are to prevent any pressure points, because any place where the weight of the bag hangs will be a pressure point. And this would distribute that pressure all along the llama's back and would not make him sore. But this, uh, because the saddle's so thin, it needs a nice hefty uh, pad like this. What about grooming a llama before putting on the saddle? In the morning before I pack the llamas, each one I run my hand right along their back and a little bit down their sides to make sure there aren't any large things in there. Pine cones sometimes will get embedded down in the wool and be hard to see because they'll be more or less buried. Or big sticks might get in there and if I'm in a hurry and just throw the saddle on without checking, I might have an irritation underneath it. Most of these boys have had their underwool combed out. And that makes the grooming a lot easier. I also use the leaf blower to get the real fine stuff out from underneath. A leaf blower that I got at Sears on sale for $59. It really kind of helps. This llama has been um, groomed a little bit before I got him with a blower and with brushes, so he doesn't have too much debris. But as you can see, it kind of collects down deep. And the stuff uh, that's kind of large in an area where the pack saddle rests could possibly irritate their skin if it ever got way down there. So I try to get the big pieces out. Grooming them is also a way of desensitizing them. I like to be able to put my hands along and under their belly and pat their belly because this is where their back cinch goes. Well, we make sure that the dirt's cleaned out of their backs. Um, we don't use a brush necessarily. We usually use our hands and shake them and fluff up the wool and that kind of thing. Make sure there's there are no burrs or anything in there before we put the saddle on. Before I put a pack on, I like to run my hand down the spine very firmly. You know, if there's grit in there, little hay pieces, you can definitely feel it. And that certainly would become abrasive with a heavy weight if the llama, this size llama, would end up probably carrying 90 pounds or something. But, you know, his skin would become abraded or slightly, uh, you know, sore from having too much grit in there. And that's one of the good things about a blower is that when he's brushed this much, if you go back to blowing, all this fine stuff would come out. And that's what I prefer to do before packing. How do you go about securing the pack saddle? I usually put it about a hand's width behind the neck. If you get a pack like this, with this sort of attachment system, 
the length of the cinch is what you use to adjust to the individual animal. So he takes a 28 inch cinch, some of my others take a 24. Uh, he's fairly large back in the rear part of his of his barrel so he needs a longer cinch. This is a 30 inch cinch. And so one of the hassles I have to go through at the start of every packing season is figure out what size cinches all my animals need. So you can bend down, look through and grab the cinch and pull it up. What I do is just reach all the way around the animal. You can see I've got my hands meeting here. Show you that he's not as big around as you think, but I just reach around, grab the cinch. I've got it on this side. I tighten it up as much as I can. I put it on real tight. Let me do it from this side so you can see how it works. You pull the cinch up, take the Velcro, and then just left and that won't come off it's secure and then the rear one you can do the same way I'll put it on from the other side I never worry about left or right side of the animal whichever side's convenient and the only really important thing here is making sure you don't set it so it rides up on his penis I try to keep it so it's, again, about a hand's width in front of his penis. And with him, he's got a relatively long back, so I don't really worry about that too much. I've got a few animals that are short coupled, and it's hard to set it just right so that with the front cinch on correctly, it doesn't ride back onto his penis. And there, there's one that's so short coupled that I have to tie the cinches together so that the back cinch doesn't ride back too far. Some packers tie the cinches together just as a matter of course. One thing that's extremely important for any packer who's wearing two cinches is to have the two cinches connected. And the distance one has to measure when it's on the llama, but basically, usually about nine inches is about right. But uh, the main purpose of connecting the cinches is that the back cinch should not ride up the llama's tummy and cut, cut him right across the sheet. I lay it back down there and keep a hand here on the cinch, reach underneath, which he's been sensitized so he doesn't care that I'm bending over like that, and put my hand behind the ring so that no hair gets in there while I'm pulling up on this is a Velcro latigo and gently bring it up snug. A front cinch you want snug and when you saddle them the first time some of them tend to puff up a little bit and so you'll saddle them then you'll want to a few minutes later when you go to put the packs on or whenever check the cinch again to make sure that it's not loosened. Also as they travel down the trail after they've had a potty stop or <coughs> after an hour or so a lot of times they'll lose some volume to their body and your cinches will loosen. So if you've been traveling for a little while and then you're going to come to a steep section up or down, you might want to make sure to check your cinch before. Same thing with the back cinch. Reach under. Having this hand here keeps him from ducking away too much to the other side. It's my theory anyway. This goes on the slope of his belly, right about there. You don't want it too far up so that it rubs on his penis, so you don't want it too far down or it really won't be doing you any good. It stabilizes the load forward and backward when it's in that slanted position. Same thing, put your hand behind the latigo, or behind the cinch ring as you tighten the latigo, put it in place. This cinch does not need to be as tight as the front cinch. The cinches used by Mama's llamas are nylon straps with Fastex buckles to secure them. Yeah, should be okay. So do you cross those? Mm-hmm. Cross them underneath. Seems to keep them in place better and keeps it off the softer belly parts. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more adjustment here because you don't use the Velcro straps, you use a 
a regular strap. This could be leather or nylon. And it's attached. It's attached much like a a regular saddle is, is attached to a horse. You run the strap around a few times, it's like a, a pulley system there. And then attach it like this. He's pretty small, so I've got a lot of slack here. Do you use breast straps, bridging, or cruppers to help hold the load in place? Since we'll be going downhill today, we've rigged up a modified bridging for Murphy. It's a cinch connected with two nylon straps to the ring of his back cinch with a ladder lock buckle attachment to, to snug it up. The proper position for it to ride is just about there so that it doesn't inhibit the movement of his back leg. Too high up and it'll just get work its way up under his tail. For Murphy, his saddle tends to work forward going downhill, but it doesn't tend to move backwards going uphill. He's narrow in the shoulder and wide in the barrel, so he kind of slides forward like that, but it doesn't move back. The, the first pack trip that we took our llamas on, we were hiking with, with very strange things on them because we really didn't have llama packs. We had back, human backpacks that were tied on the back and we had old burrow packs that we'd modified and we had all this crazy stuff. And nobody had a, had a, a chest strap or a rear strap. And um, on the way, everything went fine on the way in with a few minor little, little problems that I, that I can't even think of right now, but coming back it was a very warm day and we stopped for a long time to take a swim. And our llamas were tied up along the riverbank and we climbed down where we couldn't see them. When we climbed back up to our llamas who were tied to trees, um, there were five llamas. Three of them were this great picture of, picture this, the tree, the llama, the rope, and the pack right here between the tree and the llama. I mean they had backed out of their packs. <laughs> now. They were fine. This was very safe. No one got hurt, but um, that could have been a wreck if they tried to do that, you know, mid-trail. And um, also, in those first years, we going down, 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 down steep hills. We had a few occasions where llamas were wearing their packs on their neck. You know, by the time we got to, you had to stop and pull those packs back. If you're just hiking along really flat territory, you don't need to hook up the front and rear straps. You can just leave them off but um, they're there. This particular pack has Fastex buckles here that are for use with a breast collar, which would go around like this. They also have Fastex buckles back here that are for use with a crupper. That is a strap that would go from these buckles back and underneath his tail. The crupper will keep the pack from sliding too far forward. The breast collar will keep it from sliding too far back. I never use either one of them. I find that sometimes when I'm going downhill, the packs slide forward enough that I'll have to get back to the back of them and pull it back. And every once in a while, if there's another animal tied to him here, uh, they'll pull back on it if they stop to take a leak and it'll pull the pack back so I may have to shove it forward but for most of my uses this system is secure the way it is. Uh, some packers go with only one cinch with other types of packs. I like the two cinches but I don't use the breast collar or the crepper. What sort of pack bags do you use? A uh, Tillman pack that I bought when I first got my llamas. They have a zipper but basically it's one main compartment with couple of outside pockets. They attach with these two straps onto a saddle that's like a crossbuck saddle, pivot pack, which I use primarily. The, these are a modification of that without the pockets. Just a major duffel bag with a drawstring. Compression straps around the outside, also corner straps to hold that in. 
straps that fa fit on the pack saddle. No straps, no special straps for top packs on these. That's why I use the bungees. And then on some of the saddles, I have these attachment straps long enough that I can tie a top load on with the ends. There's a very quick to go on and off. Virtually all these are. With these types, you can raise or lower the pack bag on the side of the animal. Sometimes if you load your load as balanced as possible, but one side still seems to shift, if you drop the high side down a little bit, lower your center of gravity, a lot of times you can um, balance your load without having to readjust the things in your pack bag. A rock also works well. <laughs> Throw a rock in the, in the light side. These are the pack bags that go with the Shasta pack. Most of your soft packs and your hard packs as well have some sort of pack bags that come with them. And uh, these are very well made, but lots of different packs on the market have good quality pack bags that go with them. Do you have any advice about haltering? He does have a little bit of a problem being haltered. He likes to raise his head up and off to the side, which is quite common for llamas. It's not uncommon, but they can be uh, trained out of it. Usually what I do is get him in a corner, ask him to stand, then work my hand up the side here, getting the crook of my elbow right here behind their neck. Because their neck's so long, you have a pretty good hold on them that way. Now, you'll see what his typical response is when I try to bring this halter up is that. You lay the halter in front of him and he continues to raise his nose. Good. So rather than fight him and let him get away with that, I, the next stage of that is to roll his neck around over my hip and put it behind his ears more in the uh, armpit. Then with my hand, I've really got a good hold on his cheek, I can gently bring the halter up to his nose. And it's not very stressful. I'm not really fighting. We're not having any kind of a, a battle of muscle. I just slowly ease him into it. And he's quite good today. The proper fit on a llama halter, which I'll show you over here, is so that they have enough room to chew here. Not too high on their nose so that it rubs their eye, but not down too far to where it can get on the cartilage on their nose and push in and hurt their bre uh, breathing. So you like about this much space so he can chew. If this is too long, then you're, you want the halter to kind of pull from right behind the head there. If this is too long, you lose some of that action. You've got a lot more slack and you, don't, you won't get the responsiveness from the animal. Fast clips that you can hook right onto here. I always take those off and fasten them this way. If I'm just going to use the animal for a few minutes, I'll use the clip because it's more convenient, but I've had those clips break. So for packing, if I have to leave the halter on for a long time, I want it to be as secure as possible. Okay, Bo. He's had this on so many times. You can see there's no qualm about getting his halter on. He's one animal I have that's not very head shy. He's pretty good about his ears. Others, as most people who have llamas know, really react to that. This is too loose in the throat latch. See, the total control, your total commands are transmitted directly from the lead rope through the ring to this and to the back of the head and I would rather have this a little snugger so that it fits just a little bit further up under his jowl here like that and then the nose band won't be too big uh, it'll be just about right so I'll take this up basically the function of the nose band is partly just to let us control the direction of the llama's head so it should fit comfortably and certainly if a llama is going to have a halter on for any length of time, it needs to be loose enough that he can chew his cud com comfortably. And in this case, you can see there's quite a bit of space here. It's high on his nose, which is good, and but there's plenty of room 
if he should be left uh, an hour or two and he wants to chew his cud, he can chew it. How far do you expect to pack in a day? Well, you should be able to go as far as you can walk, no problem, you know, 10, 15 miles. Um, llamas uh, can do that if they're conditioned and their pack's not too heavy, they can do it. The most we've done in a given day is 13. Um, now that's not, that's not um, pushing the limits of the llama, I don't think. But then, that's, commercial packers aren't really all about pushing the llamas of the llama. I found that, and, and still find, that people that, that personally are taking their llamas out on their own um, agenda are hiking different distances, maybe, maybe going further and staying out longer than we are as commercial packers. We initially, when we started our pack business, started hiking days that, you know, a short day would be seven, eight miles, and we would hike between seven and ten miles a day. And the llamas handled that fine, and we handled it fine. What we were running into is that when you hike that, uh, given that llamas' um, comfortable walking pace is two to three miles an hour, you're um, spending your day pretty much packing up, being on the trail, a short lunch break, back on the trail, and getting into camp four or five o'clock in the evening. Time to get to get unpacked, your tent set up, get dinner, and start this procedure again the next day. We found that, that comfortable because we like to move, we like to hike, we, we like the work um, that's involved. But we, what we ran into after commercial packing for a couple of years is the clientele that were, in their own way were telling us that, they, you know, well, we didn't really want to sign up for Outward Bound. <laughs> you know? We found ourselves cutting way back, and now we average about six miles a day, which is not very much. How much weight do you put on your llamas? Uh, we load ours about 80 to 100 pounds, and that's for a 350-pound llama. Um, and I think that's about maximum. I mean, if it, you know, some of them can carry more than that, but I question whether that's good for them over a long period of time. I think it tends to break them down, um, causes them perhaps to fall on their pasterns, hurts their backs. Um, I just don't think they're made for that kind of weight over a prolonged period of time. So we try to keep it under 100 pounds. Well, we tend to pack between 65 and 75 on our llamas. Um, the larger llamas, we have two on our pack string who we didn't meet today. They live um, up at Kirkwood, up the mountain most of the time. They, they are bigger. They're the close to 400 pound llamas and that carry 85, 80, 85 without any difficulty. But most of our llamas are pretty average size. They weigh in um, the high 200s to the mid threes and so they're carrying between 65 and 75. What I experienced when I traveled to Peru and packed with um, llameros or llama packers in South America in, in the mountains of Peru was their style was just so, so different. When, when the the Indians were packing themselves for their own use, their, their um, farms, goods. They were using exclusively um, sacks that were made, in their case, they were all made out of yama wool. They're called costals. And they're tied on with the soga, the, the woven rope. Okay, so this is like a picture of the, you know, the large potato sack that you see when you see pictures of South American yamas. Now, this potato sack would you know, the size of it and the shape of it puts weight constraints on it right there. You know that that potato sack, even chock full, is not going to weigh, weigh 80 pounds. It's going to be heavy, it's going to weigh 50 pounds or so, but it's rare that it's going to get up to 80 pounds. So, I didn't experience anyone in South America packing much more than 60 pounds or so on their animals. Is it necessary to condition a llama physically before starting out on a pack trip? It's absolutely essential that they be conditioned. So we've designed our schedule of trips so that we do real easy ones at the beginning of the season, which helps them and us get in shape. And then we work into the more difficult and longer trips. And that works really well for us. I start in the spring by taking them on uh, short walks with packs of maybe 40 pounds or so um, out here. In the, I also start by putting them out in the big back pasture early where they get a lot of exercise. These guys are working all summer, their feet get tough. If, if the llamas have enough space 
and if they have um, if they play with each other at all, if they romp at all, they, like horses, will do a lot of self-conditioning. You don't want to think they're doing it themselves, i.e. you don't watch them running about and, and exercising a lot. Definitely exercise them before you take them out and make them do hard work. What about routine health care and nail trimming? They're just their annual vaccinations and, um, and worming. That's very important to keep them in good health and you'll avoid a lot of health problems just by keeping up with their regular routine of vaccinations and warming and toe trimming is very important before you go on a hike. Uh, if their toes are too long they'll they might walk awkwardly make their feet sore that sort of thing. Good boy. His nails are quite trimmed right now so I don't need to trim them. When they're out on the trail in the summertime they stay worn down. When they're in the pasture in the winter on the softer ground they tend to grow out and I usually trim them probably twice in the winter time and then make sure that they're trimmed up in the spring. What sorts of gear do you go out with? I have duct tape. <laughs> I actually have more duct tape in another spot. But it's a little tent repair kit. Never opened. And an extra beaner and a little bit of nylon for whatever patching purposes. Other things you could think of to take are a speedy stitcher. This is also a little bell I got that I, I put on the ones that are not staked. Just so if they disappear into the trees to graze or browse and or sit in the shade and I can't see them, oftentimes I can hear them and so I don't think that they've disappeared. No, of course we take trowels for toilet facilities. This is a first need water filter kit. Horse flies and mosquitoes bother the llamas quite a bit when we're in the back country. So I try to cover their heads and the front of their chest and the front of their legs. Any part of their body that's not really woolly with the horse fly repellent at the trailhead because most commonly that's what bothers them while we're hiking. In camp, then, I try to use mosquito repellent for, uh, on, their, on their faces, mostly their faces and their ears. It's really important not to get it in their eyes. Um, sometimes just an aerosol spray over their head will, will do that, but I also cut my hand over their eye and give them a few squirts as well. Any human insect repellent will work on the llamas. This is uh, just an eye splice that you can learn from any knot book. Ice splice. Ice splice. I. I, I ice splice. Uh, this is what's called a rope adjuster. And it fits through two holes, and then you've got a third hole free here. Quick tie up if you you know need to in a hurry. Throw it around the bar on the trailer. Clip it into that, and you're tied. I've also I spliced a ring in the back. One of the things I do most with this ring, besides crack my knuckles while I'm hiking down the trail, is that if I've got a tarp and I want to put it up, clip this end into the grommet on the tarp, bring this around the tree and clip this here. It's also another way to quickly tie them up. It's also another way if you need to stake a llama out, you can put a carabiner in and stake it short with this, this way. Um, this thing can go also works real good for tarps too, but this little loop here works good for laying over the cross piece on the pack saddle. Every llama carries uh, his own stake line which uh, I prefer to have in this platform rather than a rope because this is 24 feet long and it's very compact. It only weighs a pound. And uh, this way, every llama has his own bell and his own stake line. What first aid supplies do you take for llamas? A few items. Vet wrap, which is a kind of uh, bandage that it's kind of like an elastic bandage if you, to cover a wound with that conforms to the shape of the animal and sticks to itself. This is a tube of uh, Tribrisin oral antibiotic paste that you can give if an animal, um, for example, snake bites or some sort of deep cut or something where you're worried about the potential for infection. Antibiotics are called for. This is banamine, which is used for um, uh, if an animal injures itself, is it in pain, or some sorts, uh, types of gastrointestinal 
um, problems, you can give them this and they'll soothe them enough to usually get them out and get them home, get them to more care. Uh, it's in granules right now. You mix it up with water and I have this uh, syringe that um, suck it up in and then you can just inject it orally. A few gauze pads for covering injuries. I got these when I went into the Snake River. If you pack into an area with rattlesnakes, potential for a snake bite on a llama is fairly high because they're curious and if a snake is feeling threatened and coils um, and buzzes, a llama will possibly stick his nose down to see what it is. And if they do get bit on the nose, the venom might not kill them, but the swelling can block off their nasal passages, which is where they breathe. So I got these surgical, or they're not surgical tubing, they're uh, feeding tube, uh, catheter type tubing, and inserting one in each nostril, the hole in either end allows them to continue to breathe. They don't breathe through their mouths, right? Not really, no. Uh -uh. This is um, Fierson ointment, um, Fierson DMSO ointment, I think. It's good for cuts. Last year I had a llama that developed an abscess right where his pad meets his foot and um, I drained the abscess, covered it with that, wrapped it with a piece of gauze or put that over it, wrapped it with that tape and then put a little duct tape around it and he walked out. By the time he got home he developed it on the uh, third to the third day of a five-day trip. By the time he got home he wasn't even limping and I repeated that both days, the other two days that we were out. Waterproof tape works real good for covering up things that, are, that could get wet, that'll hold longer than sometimes the tape. This is just another form of uh, ACE type bandage, elastic bandage to wrap around. Betadine swabs, which are good for cleansing a wound, like I cleanse the abscess first before I put this on it. This is a spoon for mashing up the granules. <laughs> this is um, um, neomycin, uh, back to neomycin eye. Ointment. You can lay under their eyelid if they like, get a stick in their eye or something, injure, eye injury. And that's kind of your real basic things. Other things people take are a thermometer. I've been quite lucky, and other than that abscess, I've never had an injury or anything that I've had to deal with on the trail. What sorts of kitchen equipment do you pack? Well, we take eating utensils, we take cooking utensils. And we take uh, ice chests to preserve the food because we take all fresh food. And then we have a, uh, another ice chest that's got blue ice and dry ice in it. Um, because if we're out for five or six days, we need to change the ice to keep the, the food cool in the, in the coolers. So the dry ice keeps the blue ice frozen until we need it. Um, and we just swap ice in all the food chests. So that's primarily what we do. We've got uh, a big griddle that we use, and we've got pots, and you know those kind of things, coffee pots, and we've got uh, we're using Coleman single burner stoves right now, and uh, water bottles for carrying drinking water. We carry uh, water filters to make sure that uh, nobody gets sick from Giardia, uh, that sort of thing, while they're out on the trail with us. Uh, so all the drinking water is either boiled or filtered. Um, then we have big uh, water sacks that we use in camp for washing and stuff like that, too. Kelly, you can film these or eat them. I'll eat them. They look good to me. What food do you pack for llamas? I take along a bag of uh, llama chow that is especially designed for llamas. It meets all their nutritional needs. It's a mixture of alfalfa pellets and grain will do nicely about one pound per llama per day if you're going into an area where this feed might you know the grass and that sort of thing might be sort of sparse if you're going into lush spots um, you might not need that much because it's more of a treat than anything else we pack a combination of crimped oats and pelletized alfalfa pelletized alfalfa without any medication in it. It's just uh, alfalfa meal. But we do that simply because sometimes there's no graze, no feed where you camp. Other times there is feed where you camp, but if you're hiking with your llama all day, it doesn't really have time to, to eat enough. Okay? They get about a half a coffee can in the morning and a half at night. It's only about a pound of food, maybe a pound and a half a day. It's not very much food. How about water for llamas? 
I offer them water morning and evening if the grass they've been eating is fairly dry, if they haven't drank from a stream along the way, that sort of thing. Oftentimes they'll refuse it, it just depends. If the grass is really wet with dew in the morning and they've been eating that, they won't be thirsty. But I offer it morning and evening. Make sure that they're offered water at least twice a day. If it's hot, then, then three times a day. And that is if they're tied in a place where they can't get to water, which is true most of the time, seeing as it's not ethically all right to tie your lawn within a couple hundred yards of streams and, and lakes um, because of the pollution problem. They're so they not, would always be tied away. Yeah, they're not ready. They can't get water. So you need to bring it to them or take them to the water. Do you have to worry about giardia for llamas? No, no. They don't seem to be affected. They're not known to be carriers and they don't seem to be affected. One thing people often wonder about is how often the llamas drink. and. One thing I've found through the years is that they don't drink a lot. So if I've got the animals on a trail, I'll take them all day without even offering them water sometimes. Or I won't worry about taking them on a, a long stretch that doesn't have any water. Uh, because I've seen so many times when I'll take them through streams, stop, offer them water, they won't drink hour after hour. Uh, when they do drink, it always seems to be in a little muddy puddle in the middle of the trail or in some gross, brackish, swampy place. You stop at the nice, clear, purely running stream, forget it, they didn't want it. You go a little farther, here's this swamp with mosquito larvae in it and all sorts of moss and algae and that's where they suck up the water. <laughs> Do you have any special advice about arranging the gear in the packs? It's best to stick your gear down inside with the heavier items near the bottom, fill out the corners of the bags, use most of your available space, and still leave enough room to get your drawstring to draw a little bit on top. When you fasten these straps, don't fasten them as snug as possible, and you'll see why when we hang this on the llama, otherwise it's too, it won't really suspend, it'll all be kind of bundled up. And you want it to kind of hang out a little bit. Try not to put anything with a sharp side or edge on the inside next to the llama's back. If I have any advice for people about packing, it's to keep your center of gravity low if you can. Uh, when I pack, I put my heavier things in the bottoms. Try to keep the heavier items I have in the packs themselves and load my lighter items up here. The place where I get in the most trouble is if I've got light things in my panniers and heavy things in my top load because then they start to sway. And once they start to swing, if these packs aren't perfectly balanced, it's going to start to shift to one side and just keep on shifting and pretty soon the whole load will be underneath. And if you've got an experienced llama, he'll just stand there and wait for you to come, take the pack off and reload. If you've got an inexperienced llama, you may have a rodeo on your hands. Equal distribution of weight is very important in llamas. I think it's even more important in llamas than it is in horses and, and burros and mules. In llamas, I think it's even more important because of the fact that llam llamas are amblers. As llama owners know, that means they move both legs on one side of their body at a time. They are therefore swaying a lot. Their weight needs to be balanced and I think that a real handy quick way to do that is to be sure that you have all the contents that you're taking with you packed into smaller stuff sacks so you can compact everything. Uh, um, we all do that when we pack our suitcases and then at the last minute we throw in a bunch of things that are, that are loose. But packing things into bags first, weighing those bags and then putting those into the packs of the llama is real, real helpful. And beyond that, um, a quick way of, of being sure those things are weighed up is to use what we call a number line. It's a piece of surveyor's tape that you know is very thin and very colorful. And you roll that surveyor's tape out on the ground and have numbers about a foot apart. Numbers one, we just use numbers one through 20 because we rarely have one bag that's over 20 pounds. If we do, we can put the weight mark on that bag separately. So we put the number line out, and then all things that weigh one pound are put by, lined up on the number one. All things that weigh seven pounds are put by the number seven. 
So then at the, you, you weigh everything, and then you can grab seven pounds for the right and seven pounds for the left and six pounds for the right and six pounds for the left, or seven and five and two. How close do you try to get your weights to match? We try, we try to have it exact because if we're exact, then um, the other variable in, in a balance load is bulk. So if our weights are exact, then we can allow for some for the bulk and the way the bulk distributes. Some llama has to carry a scale because it's necessary to have your packs loaded equally on both sides. So we carry a little scale like this and we've sewn a handhold on it so that one person can hold it up and another can see what the pack weighs. I feel that the panniers should be within a couple pounds of each other. Um, I'm to the point now where I've done it so many times I don't use scales, I just lift them up. I know pretty much how much weight they are and how consistent they are, but for somebody that is a recreational packer that goes once a year, I think a scale would be really important to make sure you don't have more than 40 pounds on each side, to make sure that uh, you don't have 25 pounds on one side and 40 pounds on the other. If you do, you'll find it out real quick when you get on the trail, because that pack won't be on very long. How do you transport your llamas to the trailhead? It depends on how many llamas you're going to take. If you're going to take one or two llamas, you can use a pickup truck or maybe even a van would be fine. But if you're taking nine or ten llamas, then you're going to need a trailer. And um, you can use a, a regular steel stock trailer, uh, but they're very heavy. Uh, aluminum, of course, is <clears throat> ideal, but it's uh, very expensive. Um, we use a wooden trailer for our trips around the mountains because it's uh, lighter weight and it's also open and so it's airy and the llamas can stay cool and uh, it's also uh, uh, built higher off the ground for road clearance because we go on some pretty rough roads with them. So this trailer is uh, six feet wide by 14 feet long and it'll carry nine or ten llamas. need to have a canopy over the top of it perhaps if you have new llamas that aren't used to traveling in trailers. Um, we don't use that. Our, we don't have a top on ours at, our, at all. Ours are uh, used to traveling open air like that, such as, you know, a convertible, and they don't jump out. Um, they're just very, very used to it. And uh, we do tie them in so that they're not moving about in the trailer. They stay in the position in which we, we first uh, put them in the trailer. How do you attach the packed bags? The idea is it's kind of a two-person operation to start because you want to support the load on both sides once it's on the animal so it doesn't tip the saddle one way or the other. These type of packs, it's a real simple little fast text buckle. Try not to have it laying so that it's an angle, otherwise it'll feed itself out. Try not to have this pushing against that. Sometimes it'll possibly pop open, but it's very rare. A one way to keep it from feeding out is to tie a knot right here when you get it where you want it. Now she supports that while I put on this side. One way that I've found to do it alone, if the loads aren't super heavy, is that I'll open these quite wide, have them already clipped together, lay them on that side. Well, I'll, I'll hook my side first and support the weight with my copious belly and then pick that up and lay it over and let it lay on that side then I can back up and snug things up a little bit but if you if your loads are very heavy and you put them on one side and then walk around the other side you'll tip your saddle good okay now we let them down on this saddle there are these steel braces and this pack slides on like that. And then it has Velcro tabs which fasten like this, front and back. And those keep the, the pack bag from flipping out if the animal uh, falls or freaks out or has some other problem. Are these full grown, these Yeah, this is it. The veteran here. You hold it up from the bottom, yeah, please. Yeah, got it. I got my knee under it. Good. 
this thing. Okay. What gear do you top load? If you have some long things like uh, and lightweight or lightweight bulky things, they'll work well for top packs. Uh, a tent under 10 pounds uh, will work well for a top pack. Um, bulky sleeping pads, that sort of thing, will work well. One of the tests to see if your load is really truly balanced is to take a corner, the bag, lift it, and let it drop. If it wobbles, 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 then it's pretty low. It's pretty level. If it goes ka clunk, then one side's heavier than the other, and you can adjust that by lower, lowering your center of gravity. Do you have any general advice about hiking with llamas? We ask people never to smoke while they're hiking. If people do smoke and they're with us on trips, we ask that they only smoke in the campsite around the campfire where there's a where we've cleared an area where it's safe to do that. Um, I think it's also a good idea to hike with a um, reasonably loose lead on the on the llama's head. I like to start out with a fairly easy pace early in the day. I like to have a rest break uh, after about the first hour, get the llamas kind of into pace on the trail, especially early in the summer and especially with young llamas. It's important to take an easy pace to start and to stop uh, every 45 minutes to an hour or so. Let them graze for a little bit, let them you know, sit down if they want, uh, and, then, and then continue to move. If you know you're going to be going up a hill at the very end of the hike, uh, I think an, uh, an easy pace during the day is, is important. Llamas seem to cruise right along at about two miles an hour when they're, when they're going, and then when you start climbing steeply, that, that slows down quite a bit. And then when you're coming downhill on the last day, that speeds up quite a bit. If you come to some logs, you've got to remember that when the llama jumps the logs, his packs will kind of fly up. Got to make sure that he's not going to bump his pack against something if he does jump a log. Sometimes you get into tight situations, narrow situations like that. I just tell my clients, if your llama stops and spreads his legs, just yell potty stop, we'll all stop, and all the llamas will probably do it. What is a good way to tie a llama when you stop for a short break? You like to tie a knot with a quick release. Start like this, lay a twist in the rope with the end of the rope laying against this part, bring the end on through, pull it snug, pull it snug to the fence, then all you have to do is pull on this end and you're loose. Now a lock on that, if you're going to go and leave your llama longer or if you're worried that he might pull on it, just lock it one time like that, but that's still a quick release to get out. Do you string your llamas together? Occasionally we'll do that. Most of our customers want to lead llamas themselves, so usually they'll all be led by individuals. Um, but if somebody doesn't want to, or a group of the people have gone off somewhere and we have to move the llamas, we tie them together. And that works just fine with our llamas. We don't have any trouble doing that. We tie the, the lead rope of the trailing llama to the saddle of the leading llama. We had, we had a llama that we used as a lead llama all the time and did just fine leading and we assumed that he always liked to lead. We found out later that he didn't care where he was, whether he was in the middle or at the end of the line. But we found that um, another llama liked to be right next to him. And if he wasn't right behind him, he was very upset. So <laughs> after a while we discovered that was a real problem. We didn't know why, why this llama, when we had him near the middle or the end of the line, was pushing all the time. I mean, he'd just run right over you. There was no way that you could stop him until he got up to his buddy, and then he was happy. Sometimes the young llamas don't like to have another llama behind them, and they, they tend to scoot along real fast. So if they get a little practice at home, they're, you're not having them kind of running past you on the trail. Um, I start by hooking the last llama to the one that will be in front of it, and then leading the second to the last llama up and hooking it to the next one and so forth until I've come to the first llama in the string. That way you've always got control of the string that you're leading and you're not letting them get all tangled up while you're walking back away from the, the first one. Um, 
it's important to attach them in a way that the rope can be released very quickly uh, and most especially that it can be released when it's on a taut line because if you do get into a wreck where a llama gets racked around a tree or falls off the trail it's most likely that your lead rope will be very tight and you want to be able to have a quick release knot or some fashion of sliding the, the rope off the pack saddle. I do hook them from pack saddle to pack saddle. I don't hook them to neck collars or to halters because it jerks their head around a lot. What should you do if you meet horses on the trail? Even though a horse may have seen a llama in, in a pasture somewhere and in its memory bank somewhere that it's picturing that llama, llamas look different when they're packed up, just like people look different to horses when they're wearing packs, and sometimes it makes them feel uncomfortable and they get spooky, where maybe they wouldn't if they were just loose out in a pasture. Um, we have two horses that live with our llamas, and when they first arrived here, they looked at the llamas like they were trees. I mean, there was, or sheep, or something that they'd seen all their life, and they, and as far as we know, they'd never seen llamas. But I, out on the trail, it's real different. Um, I think llamas need to respect that the horses um, are at a disadvantage. The llamas have seen many horses on the, on the trail. Maybe the horse has never seen a llama. And also, the people are at a disadvantage, because when you're, when you're riding a horse, your um, gee, you're at its mercy. You're up on top of that animal, and you could get thrown off and get hurt. There's a distance to fall. If you're leading a llama, you're on the ground, you're earthed. You can just make a um, an exit. Horses can react in a whole scope of manners to encountering a llama from just walking by, like we saw several do on the trail the last day, with a casual glance. Uh, from from a calm encounter like that to a very serious encounter where the horse will bolt in terror. Horses are very reactive animals and they, if they don't know what something is, sometimes they will just flee. That's their response. Um, it's very important for llama packers to give as much room as possible to a horse party that, that they pass on the trail, to get off the trail uh, at least 10 yards, downhill if possible, and to stand very quietly with their animals. And I think it's important to say hello in a friendly manner to the horse, the people on the horses. That reassures the horse as well as the people. Uh, friendly encounters work a lot better than ones where there's any kind of animosity between my horses, your llamas sort of thing. Um, on, that, on that one encounter where, where a horse would not go by the llamas and I led the other horse around, um, I've done that a couple of times where horses sometimes they're, they're not going to flee but they're just they'll stop I mean they're just kind of dead in the water so to speak and and if a person goes up and leads them um, past the llamas oftentimes that will work too. Mm -hmm. What happens when llamas encounter other animals? I mean they know exactly who's there where they are you can tell by the way they're looking their ears are pointed straight ahead their eyes are straight ahead and they, they know that there's something over there, but they're quiet. And uh, if they feel that there's uh, perhaps uh, something that may be dangerous, they may sound an alert call that they have. And it's kind of a high-pitched, oscillating sound. <coughs> you know, if a llama be curious and try to sniff a rattlesnake. Uh, but, you know, if you take those kind of precautions, make enough noise as you're going along, usually everything will, will uh, avoid you. Are poisonous plants a danger? There are poisonous plants out there that can um, make the llama sick and stop its roaming. Generally, you're going to need to get the llama back out from the backcountry and, and get some more um, serious help than caramelax or mineral oil, but that will get you started. Have you had that problem? Mm -hmm. And how, how did you know that the llama had a problem? Because it started to tremor, it was in minor convulsions. I mean, minor convulsions. It was like it wasn't it wasn't laying down and, mm -hmm. and having you know a grand mal seizure, but it was shaking. What had it eaten? It had eaten the bark off of a black locust tree. Any other plants that you avoid on, on, in your region? Your Labrador tea, which is like it's the azalea family. It looks like an azalea, and it's in the in the Sierra. Um, the pea pods of lupin are not good for llamas. Although llamas, like deer, generally tend to avoid it. The skunk cabbage is not real terrific. How about a llama that lies down on you? Llama that lies down. In my experience, the llamas that I've had lie down on the trail have been young llamas, 
that it may be their first or second trip on the trail. They might not be in the best condition possible. They might be tired. It might be hot. Um, and they're just saying, hey, this is a lot of work and I'm not sure I really want to do it. I turn, uh, if I'm leading a llama and it lies down, I turn and take a quick step at it and say, up, in a very forceful voice. And usually that's sufficient to make them stand up. Um, sometimes if that won't work, you can try pulling their head off to the side a little bit with the command up. You can lift up on their tail or their back legs. One of those um, procedures will usually cause the animal to get up. Are there any special considerations for crossing a stream? The stream crossings can be scary for llamas because it's suddenly water that they may have seen at home in one form or another that's moving. And they can't always see the bottom of it, so they don't know how they have no idea how deep it is, how safe it is. Generally speaking, if the llama trusts you, if you've done your homework, and if you go through the stream, it'll go through. But one of the things that, that I want to advise people about is really avoid a situation where you are standing on a log and your llama's down there in the stream. I mean, that could turn into a real wreck in a, in a second. I mean, if the llama decides to pull you off the log, you could wind up um, in a situation where you're hurt or you're, you've lost control of the animal. Usually the llama will just go to the other side of the stream and wait for you if you lose its lead rope. Oh, and that's the other thing. I think that's real important. If, you, if you're tr crossing your llama, and first of all, you know, it doesn't want to come and it doesn't want to come, it's feeling real nervous, and you're going, oh, come on, it's okay, everything's fine, and you're pulling on it, and then all of a sudden it decides to become airborne, it wants to leap the stream, well, let go of the rope, you know? Don't try and hang on and go with it, because it's just going to go a few feet on the other side. I mean, I don't think it's going to go far. If you want to let your llama get a drink, let him stop at the beginning of the stream. But because of their uh, inclination to defecate in the stream while you're, while you're crossing it, uh, it's good to keep them moving right through. Stream crossings where the stream is quite deep, uh, and I mean like chest deep on a llama or something like that, it may be advisable to remove the packs. I've never encountered any situation like that, but remove the packs, leave the llama across, and then ferry the packs across yourself. Because I don't know that if they were encumbered and lost their footing that they could swim out of it. Should you take any special precautions for hiking in very hot weather? Well, it would help to to shear the llamas a little bit, you know, make sure that their, their coats are not too long. Um, don't overburden them with a lot of weight. Um, take a lot of breaks, uh, particularly if you're climbing. If you're just going on a level uh, terrain, then that's not so much of a problem. But if you're climbing, you've got to take breaks, make sure that they have water. Um, not all of them will want to drink, but at least offer them the opportunity to drink uh, so they don't become dehydrated. I find that salt uh, electrolytes are extremely important because they'll sweat and lose those just like humans and they need to be replenished. Uh, watch the breathing, make sure they're not breathing too hard um, and if there's any discom discomfort with the packs or if they've slipped forward or back or sideways or something, make sure that that's corrected because any kind of an irritation like that will stress them and when a llama becomes stressed then you have real problems. Uh, they may go down and then you just have to rest them before they're ready to go again. Well, what are the signs of stress? Now? Well, uh, they may get um, uh, to the point where they're actually uh, shaking. Their legs will be shaking and, and uh, they'll be panting, uh, breathing very heavily, um, and, and just not able to walk. I mean, they may become a little stiff, too. Once you're in camp, how do you remove the packs? With this system, you just undo the Velcro straps, take off the top load, you undo these Velcro tabs, and again, simultaneously, if they're heavy, you pull them off, unload them, and go ahead. Off you go. What do you do with the llamas in camp? We pick it all the llamas in an area where they're not going to get into something they shouldn't eat. We want to pick at them where there are no small trees or obstacles that they'll get their rope too far wrapped around. Pick at them far enough so that they don't run into each other. And hopefully pick at them not too close to small trees so that they won't nibble on them and kill them. There are a couple that I do usually allow to free graze 
when we're located in campsites that are not on the trail. And they're ones that I trust and I know they're not going to leave the group. These are the picket stakes that we use. They're a screw-in stake like they sell at pet stores for dogs. I attach a 20-foot nylon line to the end and a clip. If there's too many rocks, you can use a rock and tie a rock to the end of the line and use it for an anchor and most llamas won't drag that very far. I don't like to tie them to trees for extended periods of time because they tend to debark them, chew off all the little branches and things, and they can be destructive to a tree if they're tied for long periods of time. We put these on at night so that I sleep better because if anything bothers the llama in the night, I jump up and see what's going on. And on the other hand, if I wake up and I've got bells with different sounds on different llamas around the meadow, and I hear one just scratching a little or chewing his cud, then I go right back to sleep. And I'm not worried, but I do put these right on their halter at night. We use a, a stake and we put them on a 20-foot line so they have a 40-foot diameter circle that they can, they can work in. They can graze freely within that. And then we move them if we're going to stay there. We don't let them graze the grass down in just one circle. <laughs> This isn't likely to happen on the trail. Um, this wouldn't happen on the trail. Or in camp. But it could happen very well in camp if the animals are loose. When I have eight llamas out in a, in a meadow in the mountains, I'll often leave several of them loose. And I've had this happen, that if I leave an intact male like Strider loose. He'll go over and try to breed one of the younger ones that's tied. So when that happens, I'll go grab Strider, just take him out and let the other one loose. It's one of those little problems that you have when you've got a lot of animals out there. If they were all geldings, I don't think we'd have any of that. We use a picket line and um, we've done that, we've used that now for about six years and five, six years and are real happy with it. Initially we used to tie our llamas out one-on-one -on -one to an object, either a screw stake or a tree. And we have found the flexibility of the picket line to be wonderful. This is a, to describe this to someone who's not familiar with the picket line is to say that it's a very long rope, 30 feet, 20, 30 feet long, 40 feet, as long as you want it. Ours is probably about, this room is 36 feet, it's probably about 36 feet long. And into this rope are tied um, for our pack string seven loops. Then each llama, then each end of the picket line is, is on a, attached to a screw stake. Those screw stakes are screwed into the ground, or one end can be tied to a tree, depending on what the, the turf is like. Sometimes for security, we have one end to a tree and the other end on a screw stake. Then into the, those loops, the llama's lead ropes are tied. So each llama effectively has the radius of, of its eight foot lead rope shortened by the, the knot that's tied in the end of it. Um, and then the llamas all can move that drag line, that picket line back and forth. It has a little flexibility, so it moves back and forth a little bit with the llamas. And these llamas, the, the, the main stream of our, of our um, pack string are so experienced with this picket line that, I, that one person can go out now and unscrew one end of it, tighten it, pull it up at, to about knee height, to about our knee height, and give the llamas a signal, you know, okay boys, we're going to move, and we can move that picket line, and they'll all move with it all tied in. And then we can screw it down and give them a little fresh ground. Do you have any general advice about camping? Hang up your gear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a real advocate of when you get to camp, hang up your gear. Keep your gear up off the ground. It'll last a lot longer. Rodents won't chew on it. Um, it keeps a neat camp. Now, if you've been on the trail for several hours, he's going to want a place to roll. So hopefully you'll be in a meadow that's got plenty of grass and a nice big sand pit where they can go and get themselves nice and dirty. See that? <laughs> <laughs> we bring uh, a couple of small trowels we ask everybody to just dig holes six to eight inches deep and cover it over when they're finished and not leave any trash or anything around and not to do 
any defecating within 100 feet of any water source. Um, we use big garbage bags, we collect all the trash, we pack it all out, we don't bury anything. Um, and we pick up trash that other people might have left in camps and so forth that we find along the way. Um, our general camping techniques include moderate use of campfires so that we don't uh, you burn up a lot of wood depending on the area you're going into. Um, being very careful around uh, alpine vegetation. Not uh, you, We try to avoid campsites on very fragile vegetation. In other words, if it's a high alpine lake we're visiting, we'll camp in a meadow below. Um, one of the aspects of, of, of llamas that a lot of people are drawn to are their low impact, but um, I, the dung piles that llamas leave in a meadow can be kind of high impact, but I try to reduce that by spreading them out, kicking them apart when we leave a campsite. And moving the llamas, if we're in a layover situation, staying at the same camp for a day or two, I move the llamas twice a day so that they're not grazing the same spot and making a huge dung pile in the same spot the whole time. It gives them a little more feed and it also lowers their impact. Are permits required to pack into some areas? In general, if you are packing with your llama personally, if you're a family or a couple or a single individual who wants to pack, you can take your llama anywhere where um, stock, horses and uh, other stock, mules, burros, are allowed. There are a few places in, in California that I know of, I don't know about outside of California, but there are a few parks in California where you can take no stock, where it's closed to animals, uh, other than the natural animals that live there. Um, but you can go anywhere, really, with your llama without a special permit. You may need to get a wilderness permit for yourself if you're going into a wilderness area. So uh, you may need a campfire permit. And you may need a permit just to be there. Like in Yosemite, it's limited. The number of people that can be in Yosemite at any one time is limited. So you have to have a permit there. Those permits can all be obtained, or, or knowledge about that can be obtained from the um, governing body that governs the area in which people are hiking. It's usually the Forest Service. Sometimes it's the Bureau of Land Management. But if you're commercial packing, then you need to obtain permits to be a commercial outfitter guide. That's a whole different um, set of rules. Because the, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management um, manage what they call permittees in a different way than they manage um, private people because commercial people are all about making money in the forest and so that has to be managed in a different way. Do they require insurance? Yes, yes. What's required are um, you need to have out for a guide licenses which in order to get those licenses you, you get those from the fishing game and you need to be bonded so you're licensed and bonded. Um, and Fish and Game, as I say, takes care of that in California. Again, other, other states have their own way of licensing. Um, and insurance is required, liability insurance is a, is a must. Do you have any advice for someone who is thinking about becoming a commercial llama packer? Someone who is interested in packing commercially, I think, really needs to like people. And uh, is not afraid of of uh, providing service to people when you take them out. I mean, you really have to take care of them. You have to know first aid uh, and how to take care of emergencies. You have, to, you have to be willing to take care of people's needs when they're out there, whether it's uh, social or physical or whatever. Um, that's really important. You also have to have some kind of mountaineering skills. You have to be comfortable in the mountains if that's where you're going. Um, know your way around. Uh, be familiar with that kind of environment, having done it for a while yourself, you know what to expect. Uh, because if you're, if you're afraid, uncertain, um, and unskilled in these kind of things, the customers will pick it up right away. And they will not have a confidence in you that they otherwise would have. You therefore will not get repeat business. Um, other kinds of things are more or less routine for business. Uh, determining how many people you want to take out, and where you want to start hiking, where you want to uh, conduct your trips, uh, therefore what kind of, or how many llamas you're going to have to have, uh, how many people you want to take out at one time, what kind of food you want to serve, 
all this, you've got to work up a budget, figure out how much it's going to cost you to get started, how much you're going to have to charge in order to pay for it, whether you can break even, whether you can make a profit, uh, how long it's going to be before you can make a profit, um, what kind of transportation equipment you're going to have to have, transport people, llamas, and all of your equipment, and uh, you know, be prepared for anything to happen because it usually will. <laughs> From a llama getting loose to uh, your truck breaking down uh, to somebody getting lost, uh, they went off on a fishing expedition and couldn't find the way back, and you got to go find them. Uh, all those kind of things can happen, so you got to like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm.